So, continuing with the analysis of the drugging of the human population with uh, psychiatric chemical compounds, psychiatric drugs. Um, got another extra episode. But there's an enormous amount of research and information available on this topic. If you will just engage the research and have a look at the evidence, there's an enormous amount of research. And that um, it is a multi-trillion dollar industry throughout the world. And they um, admit themselves that it's a way to make money. So it's all about the love of money, the enormous amounts of money being made by um, for the drugging of the human population throughout the world with psychiatric chemical compounds and they target children, the way that they target children with the drugging of these chemical compounds is it's just, just simply criminal and um, they cripple people's health, they murder people with their drugging and their other treatments but they cripple people's health as well, not just controlling them, and well they steal their money too, but they, they, they literally cripple people's health and as an experienced phys ed teacher, health teacher, just cannot approve the, the amount of drugging that psychiatrists engage of the human population. And it's all for money, it's all for profit. Have you been diagnosed with depression and struggle with sadness? Maybe you're scared of being criticized. Loss of interest, aches and pain. Always thinking something terrible. Ask your doctor about effects or exercise. Ask your doctor about symbols. Talk to your doctor about soul. Talk to your healthcare professional. Talk to your doctor today. Doctor. Tell your doctor. Contact your doctor immediately. Talk with your doctor. Over 40 years ago, leading psychiatrists met in Puerto Rico to map out their vision of the future. We see a developing potential for nearly a total control of human emotional status, mental function, and will to act. Their plan? To create by the year 2000 a range of psychiatric drugs regulating every aspect of human behavior. Yeah, I was uh, diagnosed with uh, depression and put on axle ADD and I was prescribed Ritalin. General anxiety disorder. Prescribed Zoloft. Bipolar disorder, and I take lithium. PTSD, Zoloft. I was on Paxil. And they placed me on Zoloft. We didn't have all. I was prescribed Cytamil. Tegretol. Lexapro. Debaco. Stolazine. Adderall. Concerta. Warzine. Prozac. Lorazepam. Epixol. Flonazepam. Lorazepam. Dexafetamine. Paxil. Siler. Prozac. Adderall. Elevil. Depaco. Lobutri. Seroquel. Etc. Etc. 100 million people worldwide are on psychiatric drugs. How did this happen? Psychiatrists convinced them they were sick. They want you to think you're diseased from birth, and that all those experiences of life, childhood, and adolescence, and teenage years, and adulthood, being a senior citizen, that these are all various stages of disease. Because let's face it, we've all been depressed at one time, we've all been anxious at one time. These are normal emotions that we feel. Every emotional and spiritual problem is reduced to a label. And of course all of those diseases require pharmaceutical treatments. This is big, big business. While generating a healthy income, claiming to be medical professionals, psychiatrists will freely confess that their profession is devoid of science. We don't really have any specific blood tests or other tests that are definitive for any mental illness whatsoever. It would be neat if it would become much more scientific. Well, if you go to my office and you tell me that you're depressed, there's nothing and no blood sample or whatever, no tests. There are not uh, current available tests uh, to verify your diagnosis. I don't use any tests. Do not have a test to say, well, this is this disorder and this is the best medication for this disorder. For many years we thought we had the tests near down, but it turned out that they weren't of any value. If you don't know what's causing the symptoms, then to give somebody something to alleviate the symptoms is close to impossible. By the time a drug's approved and it hits the general population, we don't know even 50% the side effects that are involved with that drug. And these pills cause heart attacks and liver problems and 
the immune system problems and lots of other medical problems. So you're, you're playing with fire. Every day, psychotropic drugs cause serious adverse reactions. And while psychiatrists and drug companies fully understand the dangers of the drugs they sell, their unsuspecting customers are left to suffer the consequences. Everything became worse. I mean, uh, you know, each, each mood swing was worse. He would have chronic headaches, chronic, you know, nausea, not feeling good. She was very agitated, um, very, very jumpy. She was having horrible hallucination. Her personality was um, disintegrating. Once he started on that drug, he just, the cloud just stayed over him and stayed over him and stayed over him. It got darker and darker. He thought there wasn't anything worth letting to kill himself. That was not me. That was the drugs. At least I would like to have said, I love you. I didn't get a chance to do that. In addition to crippling scores of people daily, every month, psychiatric drugs kill an estimated 3,000. But the human devastation would never have gotten this high if psychiatrists hadn't worked hand-in-hand -hand with drug companies to promote their drugs to doctors throughout the world. Today, 70% of all psychiatric drugs are prescribed by general physicians. And how is this accomplished? Marketing. It's about creating a good story that uses science, that convinces a physician to think about writing a prescription. This is not science. This is incredibly effective marketing. It has nothing to do with science. They use what I call statistical contortionism. Basically just skew the numbers, make everything look fantastic. You hide the bad numbers. They're learning every trick in the book. They're evolving into efficient marketing machines. That's working. There's definitely an unholy alliance between psychiatry and pharmaceutical sales. That's a marriage made in heaven. They're like conjoined twins. They're joined at the wallet. And with 374 mental disorders filling psychiatry's diagnostic manual and more on the way, business is booming. Pharmaceutical companies have expanded their roster of psychotropic drugs from 44 in 1966 to 174 today. The top five psychotropic drugs combined gross more money than the gross national product of each of over half the countries on Earth. Altogether, the psychiatric industry rakes in a third of a trillion dollars a year. How could this have happened? It's a tale of deception that may be difficult to believe, but fatal to ignore. We took him to a psychiatrist, and within a matter of minutes, yeah, she's ADHD, and here's your drug. And on the Medicaid, and five minutes later, he was on Zyprexa. He saw the psychiatrist and prescribed the medicine for 20 minutes. The guy didn't even look at her. He talked to her a little bit. Now, how can you tell if somebody's ADHD or not ADHD from just a few minutes talking to her? Next thing I know, I'm getting handed a a handful of Xanax. That's how easy it is to get these drugs. It's just so easy. It's just passed to me like candy. That's simple. If a person were to walk in off the street, sit down with a psychiatrist, the chances of him being prescribed a drug before he were to leave the office I would have to put it at 100%. Psychiatrists prescribe drugs. They might have different ways of diagnosing, they might have different ways of interacting with a patient, but it's rare to find a psychiatrist that uses no drugs. The psychiatrists today are, in quotes, admitting they can't cure these mental illnesses and they're therefore going to manage the illness by using a drug. Fifty years ago, a person who was going through a divorce would have relied on family, friends, clergy, and even the family doctor to a certain extent for conversation to work through the issue. They certainly wouldn't have been medicated. That was before the era of psychotropic drugs. Psychiatrists, occupying the lowest rung of the medical profession, worked almost exclusively in mental institutions. With no cures, there was little chance they would ever be respected by the public and their peers as real doctors. Psychiatrists had for years been on the fringe of medicine. Typically, the 
standard doctor internist would have very low regard for psychiatrists because it was understood not to be a very clear uh, science or art. Psychiatrists wanted to be viewed as physicians, as doctors. And in order to be viewed as physicians and doctors, the people they dealt with had to be viewed as patients. And if doctors dealt with diseases, then their patients had to be diseased. Psychiatrists had a wonderful opportunity, they felt, to become respected in the eyes of their peers. They raced to create a whole diagnostic book called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which was created by consensus. A group of psychologists and psychiatrists get together, and if they have made common observations, they have a vote and they now classify a new disease. And they give it a number and it graduates into the DSM classification. And it's a dangerous book. It's a book that has many disorders that could apply to any one of us because the disorders are not real medical diseases. And it's things that apply to nearly all of us at times. So are you afraid of meeting new people? Are you afraid of speaking in front of a large crowd of people? Uh, does it make you nervous to go and to talk to your boss about a complaint? You can invent a mental disorder based on a checklist of symptoms, and that is exactly how the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the billing bible for psychiatry, works. Since the DSM's first edition in 1952, the number of diagnoses has steadily grown. From a slender 130-page booklet listing 106 so-called mental disorders, the DSM has bloated to a voluminous 886 pages. It is only through the use of this book that psychiatrists can diagnose, drug, and bill for services. In fact, the psychiatric industry currently uses the DSM to collect over $72 billion in private and government insurance money. The DSM is used to diagnose and then give a label, and the label is used for billing purposes. That's how they get paid. You have to have a term in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in order to then call it a disease and treat it as a disease and write a prescription for it. And so because they can vote it in, they can create, and then the drug industry can just take over and market their drugs for those new disorders. And those drugs were welcomed by psychiatry leaders because it made us real doctors. Of course, first the public had to believe that there was something wrong with them and that that thing wrong was biochemical and that that could then be treated by a drug which was supposed to cure all. And so it was relatively easy, I think, to say, well, look, let's start looking at mental illness as fundamentally um, a matter of chemical imbalance in the brain. Chemical imbalance is a term that's used as a marketing ploy as opposed to anything that there's scientific evidence to support. Nobody has yet measured, demonstrated, or created a test to show that somebody has a chemical imbalance in their brain. Period. How do you market a drug that restores the chemical balance or corrects a chemical imbalance? How can you do that in good conscience if you don't even know what one is? The whole myth of the chemical imbalance was created to sell drugs. And while psychiatrists and drugs